Hello, I'm Alex Daly, and welcome to another edition of Conversations with Casey. Today, our guest is former Reagan Budget Director and Congressman David Stockman. Welcome to the show, David. Glad to be here. Thanks. So we're here in Florida talking about the recovery reality check at the Casey Summit. Um, what do you think? Is the United States economy on the road to recovery? I don't think we're at the beginning of a recovery. I think we're at the end of a disastrous debt super cycle that has gone on for the last 30 or 40 years, really incepting when Nixon defaulted on our obligations under Bretton Woods and closed the gold uh, window. Incrementally, year after year since then, we've been going in a direction of extremely unsound money, of massive, massive borrowing in both the private and the public sector. We now have an economy that's saturated with debt, $54 trillion or $53 trillion, three and a half times GDP, way off the charts from where it was for 100 years uh, prior to the beginning of this. And the idea that somehow uh, all of that debt is irrelevant, as the Keynesian would, uh, Keynesians would tell us, I think is fundamentally wrong in the reason why the economy can't get up off the mat. We're doing all the wrong things. We're adding to the problem, not subtracting. We are not allowing the uh, debt to be worked down and liquidated. We're not asking people to save more and consume less, which is what we really need to do. Um, and, and so therefore, I think policy is just making it worse. And any day now, we'll have another recurrence uh, of the kind of economic uh, crisis we had a few years ago. Uh, you paint a, a very <coughs> stark picture, but if people uh, just stop spending, start saving, won't companies like Apple see their earnings hurt, won't the stock market then start to tumble, people's net worths fall, isn't that not a negative cycle that feeds on itself? Sure it does, but uh, that you can't live beyond your means because it's pleasant uh, if uh, it's not sustainable. Okay, and clearly the level of debt that we have is not sustainable. Um, we have a whole generation, the baby boom, that's about ready to retire. They have no retirement savings. We have a federal government that's bankrupt, literally. Bank at $16 trillion and growing by a trillion a year, something's going to give. We can't pay for all these entitlements. Uh, there won't be, uh, you know, the uh, revenue generation in the economy to do it. So as a result of that, we are deluding ourselves if we think we can just continue to spend. Look at the GDP that came out in the first quarter of this year. Uh, it was only 2.2%. Most of it was personal consumption expenditure, and half of that was due to a drawdown of the savings rate. Not because the economy was earning more income or generating more real uh, output, it was because of a drawdown of savings. That is exactly the wrong way to go but it's a indication of uh, how severe the crisis is going to be. I'm not saying the, you know, the economy should stop spending entirely. I'm only saying you can't save 3% of GDP and spend 97% uh, if you're going to get out of this fix. So as the savings rate goes up, both in the public sector, which means reduction of spending and the deficit, and as the household sector actually begins to seriously reduce their debt burden, which has not really happened, they're going to, on the margin, spend less, save more, it'll slow down the economy, it'll undermine profits, I agree, but profits today are way overstated. They're based on a debt uh, bloated economy that uh, isn't uh, sustainable. So we can only live by, uh, beyond our means for so long, I think yeah. as any family budget knows. Now the government can reduce its expenses at any time by simply reducing spending uh, and, and reduce its debt if it brings in more tax revenue. That's sort of austerity, I, I think is how they refer to it. But won't austerity um, cause massive joblessness? Won't there be millions more people in this country not receiving a paycheck? Yes, but uh, the critique, uh, the clatter, uh, clamoring and clattering that you hear from the Keynesians now, or even mainstream media, which uh, you know is pretty clueless economically, I think, that austerity is bad forgets the fact that austerity isn't an elective course. Austerity is something that happens to you when you're broke. And yes, it is painful and spending will go down and unemployment will go up and uh, incomes will be impaired, but that is a consequence of, of the uh, debt uh, creation, uh, excess debt creation that we've had for the last 30 years. 
So austerity is what happens when you break the rules. And somehow we have this debate going on. They're making a mistake. They chose the wrong strategy. Do you think Greece chose the wrong strategy with austerity? No. No one would lend them money. <laughs> That's yeah. why they ended up in the uh, place they were. Do you think that Spain today is on the teetering on the brink because they said, oh, wouldn't it be a good idea to have austerity? No, they had a gun to their head. They were forced to do this because the markets would not continue to lend. And even uh, now, their interest rate uh, is again rising. The markets are losing confidence. And unless the ECB prints some more money and bails them out some more, uh, they're going to have austerity. So the austerity upon us is the second, is the backside of the debt super cycle we had for the previous 30 years. It's now, not austerity discretionary. Austerity hasn't been forced upon us yet. I mean, the, the dollar is up. People are, are continuing to buy treasuries. Both nations and banks are buying treasuries. The, you know, by all extents and purposes, people are continuing to show massive confidence in the U.S. government, lend it money at extremely cheap interest rates and letting it build up this debt. Uh, are you, so you're advocating that, unlike Greece or Spain, taking it to the edge and austerity being forced upon us, that we should volunteer for austerity today uh, instead of just kicking the can down the road and living high a little bit longer until the bill collectors finally come knocking. Uh, why go today? Why start austerity now instead of doing what Greece did and going as long as you possibly can? Because Greece is a $300 billion economy, tiny, a rounding error in the great scheme of things. It's the uh, last time I checked about eight and a half months worth of Walmart sales. Okay, that's a little different than when you have the $15 trillion heartland of the world economy, when you have the $11 trillion treasury market, which is at the center of the whole global financial system, buckle and falter. That's the risk you're taking if you say, le le manana, kick the can, let's just wait uh, for something good to happen. This market isn't real. The 2% on the 10-year, the you know, 90 basis points on the five-year, uh, 30 basis points uh, on a, a th one year. Um, those are medicated uh, pegged rates created by the Fed and which fast money traders trade against as long as they're confident the Fed can keep the whole market rigged. Nobody in their right mind wants to own the 10-year bond at a 2% interest rate, but they're doing it because they can borrow overnight money for free 10 basis points, put it on repo, collect 190 basis points of spread, and laugh all the way to the bank. And they will keep laughing all the way to the bank on Wall Street until they lose confidence in the Fed's ability to keep uh, the yield curve uh, pegged where it is today. Because if the bond uh, ever starts falling in price, they unwind the carry trade. They unwind the repo because then you can't collect 190 basis points. Uh, then you get a message, do not pass go. <laughs> you know, sell your bonds, unwind your um, uh, overnight uh, debt, your repo uh, borrowings, your repo positions. And the system then begins to contract exactly what happened in September and October 2008, only that time it was an unwind of the repo on mortgage-backed securities and CDOs and so forth. That was a minor uh, trial run for the great unwind that's going to happen when the Treasury market uh, is finally uh, shattered with a lack of confidence. Because on the margin, no one owns the Treasury bond. They just rent it on borrowed money. And if the price starts falling, they'll get out of that trade as fast as they got out of toxic CDOs. Yeah, so when people run away from the U.S., they run away all at once, basically. Well, if they run away from the Treasury, it sends compounding uh, uh, forces uh, uh, of contagion through the entire financial system. Uh, it hits next the MBS and the mortgage market, and the mortgage market then scares the hell out of people about the housing recovery, which hasn't happened anyway. And, uh, and then if there isn't a housing recovery, uh, the middle class Main Street confidence isn't going to recover because it's the only asset they have. And for 25 million households, uh, it's underwater or close to underwater. And we so, saw something much like that in 2008. All the markets correlated. Stocks went down, bonds went down, gold went down with them. And it sounds like what you're saying is that the Fed is effectively paying bankers to stay confident in the Fed 
And at the moment that stops, either because the Fed stops paying them or something else shakes their confidence, this all goes down in one big house of cards? Yes, I, I, I think that's right. The Fed has destroyed the money market, it's destroyed the capital markets. They have something uh, that you can see on a screen called an interest rate. That isn't a market uh, price of money or a market price of five-year uh, uh, debt capital. That is an administered price that the Fed has set and that every trader watches by the minute to make sure that he's still <laughs> in a positive spread. Uh, and uh, that, and you can't have capitalism if the capital markets are dead, if the capital markets are simply a branch office, uh, branch casino of the central bank. And that, that's essentially what we have today. Last night you told our audience that uh, if you had been elected president, the first thing you would do is quit, <laughs> um, or at least demand a recount, I believe were your words, yes. which I, I thought was telling. Are, are you saying that there's no policy changes we could make today that would get us out of this, or at least uh, that wouldn't get you effectively assassinated? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there, there is a paper blueprint that uh, people who believe in sound money and fiscal responsibility and that you create wealth the old-fashioned way through savings and work and effort and not simply by uh, printing money and trading pieces of paper. There is a plan that you could put together. One would be to put the Fed out of business. You don't have to end the Fed, although I like Ron Paul's phrase. You have to get them out of discretionary, active, day-to-day -day meddling in the money markets. Abolish the open market committee. We, the Fed has taken its balance sheet to $3, tri uh, $3 trillion. That's enough for the next 50 years. They don't have to do a damn thing, except maybe have a discount window that floats above the market, and if things get tight, let the interest rate go up. People who have been speculating will be carried out on a stretcher. That's how they used to do it. It worked uh, prior to 1914. And so that's the first step. Abolish the open market committee. Abolish discretionary monetary policy. Let the Fed, if you're going to keep it, I don't even know that you need to do that, but if you're going to keep it, be only a standby uh, source, as Badgett said, Walter Badgett, the great uh, 19th century British uh, financial thinker, uh, provide uh, uh, liquidity at a penalty rate to sound collateral. Now, that's what J.P. Morgan did in 1907, in the great crisis of 1907, uh, from his library. He didn't have a printing press. He didn't bail out everybody. He didn't do what Bernanke did and said, stop the presses, freeze everybody, and prop up Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and all the rest uh, of the speculators. The interest rate, the call uh, money interest rate, which was the open market interest rate at the time, some days went to 30, 40, 70 percent. And they were carrying out the speculators left and right, liquidating margin debt, taking out the uh, real estate spec uh, speculators. Eight or ten railroads went bankrupt uh, within a couple of months. Uh, copper magnets got carried out, uh, you know, on their shield. This is the only way a capital market can work but it needs an honest interest rate. And we have no interest rate, and so therefore uh, we, we solve nothing and uh, we, we have the, the kind of um, impaired, uh, incapacitated markets that we have today. They're very dangerous because they're all dependent on 12 people. It is what I call the monetary politburo uh, of the Western world. And they're just as dangerous as the Politburo in Beijing <laughs> or the Politburo uh, of memory uh, in Moscow. Wow, so a uh, 12 person uh, open just to for, you know, F -O FOMC. Person open Market Committee determining yeah. the future of our economy by yeah. manipulating rates. I mean, it sounds like central planning to me. It is. They're monetary central planners who uh, are attempting to use the crude instrument of interest rate uh, pegging and yield curve manipulation and essentially buying debt that no one else will buy in order to keep this whole system afloat. It's Ponzi economics. Anybody who had financial training before 1970 would instantly recognize this as Ponzi economics. It is only because of the last 20 years we got so uh, uh, inured uh, to prosperity out of the end of uh, a printing press and uh, you know massive incremental debt that people lost sight of the fundamental principles of sound money, which uh, just you know there's nothing um, 
you know, um, arcane about it. It's just common sense. And it is not common sense to think that 50, 60, 70 percent of all the debt that's being created by the federal government can be bought by the Federal Reserve, stuffed in a vault, and everybody can live happily ever after. Wow. So uh, governments certainly put us in a precarious position, but I don't think they alone have put America in this position, have they? You mentioned consumer debt becoming a major burden on the economy. How do we shed ourselves of that? I mean, the federal government can repudiate its debt, simply walk away from it, might see a few wars or something worse from that. Uh, it could inflate our way out of it, it can tax our way out of it. How do households get out from under the debt burden it, that they have today? Well, it's very tough, and they, ha they were lured into it by bad monetary policy. When Greenspan panicked in two, December 2000, the interest rate was 6.5%. We had an economy that was threatened by competitors around the world. We needed high interest rates, not low. He panicked uh, after the dot-com crash, and as you remember, in two years, they took the interest rate all the way down to 1% and they uh, catalyzed an explosion of mortgage borrowing, which was crazy. When they cut the final rate down to 1% in May, June, 2003, in that quarter, the second quarter of 2003, the run rate of mortgage borrowing was five trillion at an annual rate. That was nuts. There had never been even a trillion dollar annual rate of mortgage borrowing previously. In that quarter, the run rate was five trillion, 40% of GDP. Why? Because the Fed took the rate down to 1%. Floating rate product got invented everywhere. Anybody that had a pulse uh, was being uh, given mortgage loans by the brokers. The mortgage brokers didn't have any capital or funding. They went to Wall Street, they got uh, warehouse lines, and the whole thing got out of control, and millions of households were lured into taking on debt that was insane. And now we have a generation of debt slaves. There are 25 million households in America who can't move if they wanted to because their mortgages are uh, underwater and they cannot generate a down payment and the 6% broker, 5% broker fee that you need uh, to move. So we've got 25 million households immobilized, paralyzed, and worried every day about when they're going to lose uh, the property um, because of what uh, the Fed did. It's a terrible indictment. Mobility itself is the American dream, isn't it? Right. The ability to pick up and find work and then move and do all that. So now sure. we have people who are slaves to their debt. Um, but how, how do we get ourselves out of this? Is this a matter of just personal financial discipline? Is there a policy move that can happen? It's here policy. If we don't do something about the Fed, if we don't drive uh, the Bernankes and the Dudleys and the Yellens and the rest of these lunatic money printers uh, out of the Federal Reserve and get, get it under the control of people that have at least a modicum of sanity, we're just going to bury everybody deeper. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. The American people are as much a victim uh, of the Fed's uh, uh, massive errors uh, as anything else. Uh, you know, they didn't, uh, you know, uh, people were not prudent when they took on debt at 100% of the peak value of their property at some moment in 2004 and 2005. They were lured into it. Uh, but now we're stuck with something that didn't need to happen. Didn't need to happen. Now, the Federal Reserve, founded in 1914, it saw America through World War I, World War II. Saw America through Vietnam, saw America through the biggest boom in economic history of the world. Um, yet now, today, you're calling for the abolishment of the Fed. Wasn't the Fed here the entire time that America was a prosperous, growing, wealthy, technology-driven nation? Um, what's changed? The greatest period of growth in American history was 1870 to 1914. The Fed didn't exist. Uh, right after 1870, when we uh, recovered from the Civil War, we went back on the gold standard. It worked pretty well. Um, we had a World War I was a catastrophe for the financial system. The Fed financed it, but I don't give them any credit for that, <laughs> okay? Uh, we shouldn't have been in that war. It was a stupid thing to get involved in, but once we got involved in it, the Fed printed money like crazy and facilitated borrowing set the groundwork uh, for the boom of the 1920s and the collapse of the 30s. Even then, though, uh, we had great uh, minds who coped with reality in a pragmatic way in the Fed. Even Mariner Eccles wasn't all that bad. He stood up to Truman. 
in, in 1951 when Truman wanted to force the Fed to continue to peg interest rates at 2% or 2.5% when inflation was 5 Then we had William McChesney Martin, a brilliant, pragmatic, you know, he wasn't some kind of gold standard guy in a pure sense, but a pragmatic guy who understood that prosperity had to come out of private productivity, out of investment, out of risk taking, and the Fed had to be very careful not to allow speculation to start or inflation to get ignited. In 1958, he invented the phrase, the job of the Fed is to take the punch bowl away. And we uh, had a small recession. Uh, six months after the recession was over, he was actually raising the margin uh, rate on uh, the stock market loans in order to quell speculation and raising interest rates in order so that the economy didn't start to inflate again. Now, that was the regime we had until, unfortunately, Lyndon Johnson came along with his guns and butter, took um, William McChesney Martin down to the ranch and beat the hell out of him uh, and forced him to capitulate. But here's the point I would make. In 1960, at the peak of what I call the golden era, uh, the twilight of fiscal and financial uh, 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 discipline, we had 30 billion on the balance sheet of the Fed. And it had taken, um, from 1960, uh, it had taken 45 years to build that up. Uh, then, as they began to rapidly expand the balance sheet of the Fed during the inflation of the 70s and in the 80s, even then, it took us until September 2008, the Lehman collapse, to get to 900 billion. Had the balance sheet only grown at 3%, which is what the uh, capacity of the economy to grow, I think, really is, it would have been 300 billion. So they were overshooting. So three times where we should be. Where we should have been on the Lehman crisis event. But that's in not the, the wait a minute, let me finish. In the next seven weeks, this crazy lunatic who's running the Fed increased the balance sheet of the Fed by $900 billion in seven weeks. In other words, they expanded the balance sheet of the Fed as rapidly in seven weeks as it had occurred during the first 93 years of its existence. And what, as they say, and that's not all, <laughs> on late night TV, in the next six weeks, they added another $900 billion. So in 13 weeks, they tripled the balance sheet of the Fed. Wow, that's uh, incredible. So no money. wonder we're, to we're, we're in utterly uh, uncharted waters. And it's being run by people who were clueless as to how to get out of the corner they've painted this country into. Uh, they really, uh, you know, they ought to be run out of town on a rail. I think you find a lot of our viewers will probably agree with <laughs> you on that one. Uh, you know, average American is suffering. It sounds like the average American is going to have to suffer more even to get us out of this. Uh, but it seems like the only thing the Fed is interested in these days is propping up the stock market. Uh, what is that? Where does that come from? The Fed has taken itself hostage. When this whole misbegotten doctrine of wealth effects was created by Greenspan. In other words, if we get the stock uh, market going up and we get the stock averages going up, people feel wealthier, they'll spend more. If they spend more, you know, there's more production and income and you get a virtuous circle. Well, that, that says that you can create wealth through speculation. And that can't be true. Because if it is true, uh, we should have had a totally different kind of system than we've had historically. So once they got into that game, and then the crisis came in September 2008, and they panicked and just pulled out the stops everywhere, and as I said, tripled the balance sheet in 13 weeks, what they had done in 93 years, they, they are now at a point where they don't dare begin to reduce the balance sheet, begin to contract, or they'll cause Wall Street to go into a hissy fit. And they're afraid to death of Wall Street going into a hissy fit. So essentially, the robots and the boys and girls and the fast money traders on Wall Street run the Fed indirectly. Wow, 1960s, the Fed is taking away the punch bowl. It sounds like in the 2010s, the Fed is the one adding the alcohol. They're afraid to stop lest everybody riot. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they got the party going and they're afraid to stop it. Um, and as a result of that, you have a doomsday machine. 
Wow, and at some point we're going to be forced to stop it when market forces kick in and Europe and China and India stop lending us money. Uh, yes, I mean, as I say, when the crisis comes in the uh, Treasury market, it'll be uh, the great margin call in the sky. And they'll start unwinding all of the uh, carry trades, uh, all of the repo. Asset prices generally uh, will uh, be affected because this will ricochet um, and compound through the system. When does this happen? Uh, it's, uh, you know, people could look at the, the housing market and the mortgage market. Way back in 2003, there were some smart people looking at this. And they looked at the run rate of mortgage uh, issuance, gross mortgage issuance, the five trillion I was talking about. They said, this is insane. This is off the charts. This is so far beyond anything that's ever happened before. Something bad is going to come of this because it's obvious if you pour debt into markets and you allow people to leverage 98% or whatever they were doing at the time with so-called mortgage insurance and, so, and just high loan-to-value ratios, you were driving up prices. And so therefore, there was a housing uh, price boom going on and it was sucking the whole middle class into speculation. Um, so, you know, that's the, the nature of the system, and now they don't know how to unwind it. Wow, that's a pretty stark picture. So as an individual investor, what are we to do? How do we protect ourselves in this type of situation? Should I be owning bonds and staying out of stock? Should I be owning No, stocks? I would stay out of any markets because these are, these are unsafe markets at any speed. <laughs> uh, uh, with any security. Uh, it's all tied together and as I was saying when the great margin call comes and they start selling the treasury bond they'll take everything else with it. Real estate is priced off treasury. Mortgage-backed securities are priced off treasuries. Corporates are priced off treasuries. Junk bonds are priced off treasuries. Everything, stock, uh, the stock market uh, will go into a panic. Uh, so the best way uh, uh, to uh, deal with that prospect since we, we don't know when the timing will come. We've never been in uh, a world where there's 15 trillion worth of central bank balance sheets like we have today. Uh, the only thing I think you, you can conclude is preservation is the only thing you're about as an investor. Forget about yield, forget about return. Just keep yourself liquid and preserve your capital because you can't predict the day uh, when the you know, as I say, uh, the great margin call in the sky uh, comes down. So if it's not coming about ahead, if, if it's coming about not behind everybody else, just losing a little less, what's the most effective way to do that? You should hold cash, you yeah. know, alternative options? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if there's nothing wrong with owning treasury bills, you know? I mean, you're, you're going to get for a one-year treasury, what is the thing now, 20 basis points or something? So when the so, great treasury crash comes, I should own Well, it doesn't bills? mean the price of the treasury is going to uh, crash. No. Okay, so we're just going to see we're see interest rates skyrockets on new issues. U.S. government not yeah. going to be able to borrow. Yeah, but that's why you're short. If you're in a uh, uh, you know 30-day piece of paper, you're not going to lose principal. Okay. What okay. happens to the dollar in all this? If I'm holding dollar denominated yeah, Well, assets? the dollar, in theory, people would think is going to crash. I don't think it is because all the rest of the currencies in the world are worse. <laughs> so once again, America is uh, not that bad off. Well, we're, we're bad off because w w when, when the financial markets reprice drastically, it's going to have a shocking effect on economic ac activity. It's going to paralyze things. It's going to finally cause consumption to come down. It's going to cause government spending uh, to be retracted. You know, the Keynesians are right. Borrowing does add uh, to GDP because the, the GDP accounts, I mean, it doesn't add to wealth, doesn't add to real produ pro uh, productivity, but it does add to GDP as it's calculated and published because GDP accounts were designed by Keynesians <laughs> who don't believe in a balance sheet. So they said, you know, if the public sector, the household sector is borrowing, let's say, $10 trillion next year, run it through GDP, you'll get a big bump to GDP. But sooner or later, your balance sheet will collapse. They forgot about that one. So my point is that we've gone through a 30-year expansion of the balance sheet and artificial growth in GDP. Now we're going to have to be retracting the collective balance sheets, and that means that GDP will not grow or maybe even contract. And no one's prepared for that. So the economy will collapse, the dollars will be okay because we still need a medium of exchange and the dollar is the least bad currency in the world. How does gold fit into the picture? Do you think that gold is a good asset? Yeah, to I think your gold is a good asset. It's the only currency that anybody's going to believe in after a while.
Okay, so maybe you hold that as an insurance policy. Do you own gold yourself? Yeah, it's an insurance policy. Yeah. Uh, where else are you investing today? I'm set. I'm preserving capital. I'm in cash. I don't uh, think the risk of the system is worth it. So you're practicing what you preach 100%? Yeah. Well, that's great. It's good to hear. Uh, this is uh, excellent advice, I think, for our subscribers as well to consider that there's a lot of potential energy built up in this system. You articulate it well. A lot of uh, painful policy moves ahead of us and, and probably uh, something else that looks, uh, makes 2008 look like a preview, if you will. Well, it was a warm-up. Just a warm-up. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.